uh, this morning we're basically starting a brand new series over a, brand, uh, for, over a new book uh, for us, and that's the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can go ahead, go ahead and open up to the New Testament uh, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1. And as you guys are turning there, let me just briefly tell you some things uh, about Hebrews. And uh, it's a very complex book. It's a very uh, weighty book with a lot of concepts that are really difficult to maybe understand. But the beautiful thing about this book is that it, it really conveys uh, to the church the new covenant. Uh, the, the, a new thing has been done, and it's in Jesus that this new covenant has been made. He is the new, the high priest, and it basically transitions from uh, all of the practices of the Old Testament, this, this upholding the law, this offering up of sacrifices on a daily, hourly basis. And now we're entering into a new era, a new covenant, and it's Jesus. It's all about Christ. And we get this supremacy, the amazing uh, just power that comes in this person, Jesus Christ. And so this entire book really conveys that to us. And so this morning, we're going to go through the first four verses and we're going to see how Christ is revealed to us as the prophet, as a priest, and as a king. So if you have your Bibles open already to Hebrews, I'm going to start reading from verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they." So we are at the beginning of our journey through the book of Hebrews. So I want to give you just a little bit of background information on this book. One, we don't know who wrote the book. I mean, there's some speculation that it might have been Paul, uh, maybe Apollos or some other apostle, but we don't know for sure who wrote the book, all right? But what we do know is that this book was written to a Jewish community, because there's rarely any references to Gentiles in this book, but there are a ton of references to Old Testament priests, uh, to Old Testament people, to practices of the Old Testament. Uh, there is a ton of references to Judaism, to, to Jewish culture and customs and, and practices. And so as you're holding that book in your hand this morning, I want you to remember that several years ago that there were a group of Jews holding this book for the very first time. And there were a variety of people. Some of the Jews were Jewish Christians, people who had accepted, believed upon Jesus and were a part of the church. There were a group of Jews who were maybe, they understood the gospel, but it didn't impact their life. They didn't really receive Jesus into their heart. But intellectually, they knew the gospel. But again, it didn't translate into any change in their life. That's the second group. The third group of people were simply Jews who did not believe in the gospel, who did not believe in Christ. Sure, they have the gospel, they understand what happened, but they do not believe it as truth. These are the three groups of people that this author is writing to. And so as we read upon this book, and as we read upon the different things that are written there, we have to keep in mind who is the author addressing at that specific point in time. So just remember that. These are the three groups of people Three different people that he's trying to, groups of people that, he, that the author's trying to write to, what is he trying to say at each and every given point in time? And you have to be really careful as you read this book because, like I said, it is very in depth, it's very complex, and uh, just takes a lot of time and a lot of struggling to figure out what's being said at times. Um, as I told you a little bit earlier, today we're going to look through these three verses and figure out what it means for us to see Jesus revealed as a prophet and as a priest. And as a king, um, and the beautiful thing about this book, and as you read through it, is that you understand that Christ is not only a prophet, a priest, and a king, but he is the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, and the greatest king. 
He's the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, and the greatest king. His message is the ultimate message that God wants to reveal to mankind. His message is what connects every other message ever spoken about in the Old Testament, and he brings it all together in his, him as a person, Jesus Christ. Look with me back to verse 1. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son. The role of a prophet was to bring God's message to his people. The prophet received a message from the Lord, and he would convey what the, what the Lord told to the people of Israel. And if you would think back with me, back to the book of Genesis, and you see how Israel was even formed, you understand that it happened because of God's spoken word. God took aside a man named Abraham, and he simply told him, I am going to bless you into becoming a great nation. And so the very inception of Israel was when God spoke it into existence through Abraham, Isaac, and so on and so forth. And as the country continued to grow, continued to develop, they had their moments. And you know through the history of Israel that there are lots and lots of sin, and they end up you know, turning their back on God and backing away from Him. And God again would speak through an individual, through a prophet, and tell them, look, this is the way you need to go. Walk in this way. And so on and so forth. God not only began Israel with His Word, but He sustained Israel with His Word. But the thing about God is when he speaks, he, he only reveals things partly, parts of it at a time. So a various prophet would receive a part of God's ultimate message. Micah, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of these prophets had got glimpses of this ultimate truth of God. All right? They had glimpses and pictures of it, but they'd never got the full big picture. In some ways, that's how God speaks to us today, is that sometimes... We may get a glimpse of where God is taking us, but we don't know the full picture. And we only get to know that as we walk with him. He starts to reveal more and more of his ultimate plan for you in your life. And that's the way it was with God. Um, I don't know how many of you guys in here love watching television. No? Okay. Um, but there are definitely these kinds of episodes like 24, um, Lost, uh, personally, I love burn notice and person of interest, but I've said that so many times, I think, from here. But I love these shows, and I'm not sure what else is out there because I don't get much time to watch TV. Uh, but the beautiful thing about these shows is that as they reveal each successive episode, there's something more you learn about a specific character or a group of characters, and something more you get to hear about the plot or learn about the plot. And it kind of grips you. If you really like the show, if you really like the characters, it, it tends to grip you to the point where you want to watch the next episode. You want to watch what else is there that, that has to be said about such and such, or what else is there to be known about this plot. And ultimately, you're, you're craving this ultimate truth. You, you want to know the ultimate truth of what is going on. You, you want to know how does everything fit together from this person and this person, and, and how does it relate to the plot? And you keep wanting to know what's going on. In the same way, that's how God spoke to the, the nation of Israel, is that through a prophet, he would reveal a glimpse of the ultimate plan. Through another prophet, he would reveal another detail. So the nation of Israel, Israel was left trying to figure out the pieces and put them together to figure out what is God's divine plan? What is he trying to do? And in Hebrews chapter 1, the author reveals that ultimate truth. He opens up the curtain and he says, This is the ultimate truth, Israel. This is it. In the last days, God has spoken to us in his Son. Jesus serves as God's greatest prophet because he is the one who brings the final message of God in these last days. It's him who connects every prior message, every prior revelation together. And as the people of 
Israel are reading this text at that given moment, there are people in that group who are stunned with this revelation. You know, for so long, they have been wanting to put all of the pieces together, and this author is stating to them, it is Jesus that this is all about. It's Jesus. And the author wants them to get that they now have the privilege of knowing God's ultimate divine truth that connects everything together. It's Christ and Christ alone. Now, some in that crowd probably received that information and explored it further, but others probably dismissed that news and said, look, he doesn't fit the criteria of what I consider to be that Messiah, the one that they were talking about in the prophets. This morning, I want to ask you to consider a question. What does Jesus serving the role as God's prophet mean to you? Is there any significance to the fact that God's message to you is his son, Jesus? And before we get to think about that, I think it's important for us to consider what his message wasn't but should have been. God, being a perfect judge, had every right to pronounce judgment upon our heads for the sins that we have committed. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 should have read, In these last days, God has spoken to us with judgment and wrath for the wrongs we have committed against him. It should go on to say that we have been stripped of our joys, of our family, of our friendships, We have been stripped of our dignity. We have been stripped of the presence of God. We have been stripped of our life. In reality, that is how Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 should have read. It should have said that in these last days, God speaks eternal wrath, condemnation, and judgment upon the world for the ways that they have turned their back on him. But this morning, as you hold that Bible in your hands, it does not say that in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. It says, God has spoken Jesus. In these last days, God's message is his son, Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to take that lightly. You know, it's so easy for us to dismiss that and say, oh yeah, well, I've heard that in many sermons in many places in my life. But you need to understand what that should have read and what that should have meant for you and for me. We should have been placed in eternal condemnation, eternal judgment, but we have the privilege of, uh, and the grace of knowing that that message is Jesus. God has spoken Jesus over your life and over my life. And we have to understand that it is God's initiative. It was completely His doing. You and I had no right to even utter a word We were guilty. We were without a defense. There was not an attorney or a lawyer that would even consider taking our case before God because it was flat out the case. We were guilty and we deserved death for what we did. But it's in our silence, it's in that chasm that God speaks and his words are, my son, Jesus, my most precious treasure, my most precious son, I speak over your life. My banner over you is love. It's in Jesus. So again, I ask you, as you're holding that Bible and you're reading Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, what does it mean to you that God has spoken his, his ultimate prophet over your life, his son, Jesus Christ? My hope and my prayer for you and for myself is that this would sober us and would bring us down to reality. We are who we are as children of God because God spoke Jesus on behalf of us. Everything we are and will become in this life must, must, must reflect that truth. We are who we are because God spoke Jesus into our life. 
as we continue on in Hebrews chapter 1, read with me verse 2. We read, Jesus is appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. I'm not going to spend a lot of time describing each of these things, but as you read through the book of Hebrews, you will understand that the entire book just upholds the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He describes him as the creator. He is the appointed heir of all things. The the, the very radiance of God's glory, the substance, the, the very brilliance of God's glory is Jesus Christ. And it says here that Jesus is the exact representation of God's nature. And you need to look no further than the Gospels to get an idea of the nature of God. I think Jesus once said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is the exact representation of who God is. It's Jesus. And I love this is that, I love it all, but the the, the last part of it is when he says, he upholds all things by the word of his power. The, The very fact that you're sitting here this morning, as you're driving, as you're eating, Beyond that, even the, 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 the sun, the moon, the stars, the, I mean, the universe, the galaxies, all of that is being upheld because Jesus spoke, because Jesus spoke it. It's being upheld by the word of his power. And all of this points back to the, just the absolute supremacy, the authority of Christ Jesus. But I want us to go a little bit further down to verse 3. And it says here, and this helps us understand his role as God's priest. And the phrase I really want to look at is, when he had made purification of sins. When he had made purification of sins. Now, I told you that the prophet's role was to be the messenger from God to people. Well, the priest's role was to basically mediate from the people to God. Um, Before I get into this text some more, I want to give you just a brief description of Jewish culture and help you understand the context of the people who received it and what they were going through. Um, God, at the very beginning, wanted to establish a relationship with the country of Israel. So he said, I'm going to make this law, and you are to follow this law in order to have a relationship with me. Well, as you and I know, people couldn't keep up with the law. They couldn't keep up uh, without sinning. And so God ordered a system of sacrifices that the Levite priests would help enforce. And so every time someone would sin, we would have a sacrifice of some sort of an animal, and the priest would facilitate that. Do you guys know how often the priests had to work? Any idea? Every hour, every hour of every day, the priests around the clock were offering up sacrifices because people couldn't stop from disobeying or from sinning against God. It was a continual thing. And so when we talk about this piece of news right here, he having made purification of sins, he, basically Jesus once and for all offered up the perfect sacrifice so that there would not need to be made, any more sacrifices did not need to be made. It was all in Christ. You see, Priests who were offering up sacrifices also had to offer up sacrifices for themselves. Priests weren't perfect either, right? So they had to offer up sacrifices for themselves, and they had to offer up sacrifices for the people, and this continued on and on. Now, having received this news from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, you and I are just reaping that benefit. You know, if, if we had to continue making sacrifices now in 2013, I wouldn't be able to be up here this morning I wouldn't be able to hold down a job. I really don't know if I would you know, be able to have a family or, or do what I could do because I would continually be making sacrifices for all the sins that I've committed in my life. And I think we're all in that same boat. That's the way we would, we would be doing. But because of Christ, we have this blessed gift in that he became that one perfect sacrifice. And if, it, if you read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, it says... 
Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he, being Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. We are so blessed here in 2013 to receive this news. But I want you to know something. Jewish people who read that text weren't as excited as we were. You would think they would be, but they weren't. Because for them, offering up sacrifices was a systematic way of worshiping God. It was what they did from generation to generation was they offered up sacrifices and they worshiped God through what they did, through what they offered up. And so for them not to have that opportunity to offer up sacrifices and for them to try to grasp Jesus being that perfect sacrifice was a hard concept for them to follow because it meant that they had to turn away from the way that they normally did things. It meant that they had to turn away from, from worshiping God the way that they normally did. And when Jewish Christians first came into the faith, many people, especially priests, disowned Jewish Christians. Jewish priests said, such people are unclean. They do not believe in the way that we believe. And they were forbidden to worship with the other Jews in high places. They were forbidden to take part in the normal things because they were seen as unclean. And so many of the early Jewish Christians were persecuted, were disowned by their own families and community because they chose to believe Jesus Christ was the perfect sacrifice. And he committed that sacrifice that was once and for all, for all time. And so many of the Jewish Christians determined that they would partake in some of the customs of the Jews, even though Jesus accomplished the perfect sacrifice, they continued to partake in some of the Jewish customs just because they wanted to be a part of the community. But the author of Hebrews is imploring these Christians to understand the significance and totality of Jesus' sacrifice. He made purification of sins. This does not read he's making or will make, but it has already been done. There is nothing more that can be added and nothing more that needs to be done. This morning, I, I, I really believe that for those of us who've ex, who, who placed our faith in Jesus' sacrifice, we understand for a moment the depth of grace that we've been given but I, if, if you're like me, you might think in your mind, you know, it's really hard for me to grasp the fact that Jesus could love me in the way that he did. And you wrestle in your brain and, and you, you begin to, to wonder in your heart, you know, there's something more that I've got to do. I've got to present myself in a more lovable way. I have to present myself in a more better way between, between me and God and between other people in order for me to truly believe that I am worth his love. And sooner or later, we're not any different than these early Jewish Christians. We try to present ourselves in such a way that we can say, look, God, I am worth loving. Look at this good thing I'm doing. Look at the good deeds I've accomplished. You know, I am worth your love. And we take away from the blood of Jesus when we do that. When in reality, the work of Jesus has already accomplished our righteousness. It's already accomplished our acceptance. It's already accomplished all that we need to do. It's, it's nothing that we can do. It's all done by his love and by his blood. I have an 18, uh, for those of you who don't know, I have an 18-month-old daughter and uh, many of my coworkers and friends have already warned me about this thing called terrible twos. And uh, when they become two, kids are a little bit rougher. Um, I'm thinking we're already there. Um, so in the first several months of my daughter's life, she was a delight to be around. No, I'm just kidding. She, she, was, uh, she, she was very dependent on us. Whenever we would pull out the bottle or pull out the spoon to feed her, she would just come willingly to eat of the, the food that we would give her. She never threw up a fuss. She never, you know, resisted, but she was dependent on us for food. And, and, and you can kind of see how, in, in a way, how she really literally depended on us for her survival. 
But in the last several months, for the last few months, things have drastically changed. Now, when we try to pull out the spoon or try to pull out the bottle, she will throw a small temper tantrum and refuse to eat or drink unless she has a hold of the spoon or unless she has a hold of the bottle. She will just get on the floor and just whine and cry. And, you know, she's only 18 months. I'm really dreading what's going to... Yeah, God, please help us all. Um, But we're getting just these small glimpses of her desire to be independent, right? She doesn't want to be so dependent on us now, but she wants to be independent. And, man. So, obviously, her attempt at feeding herself leads to a great mess. We have to change diapers, clothes, all things. Lots and lots of times to get a, a whole bucket of resolve to try to keep the carpet. i just given up on that. But anyway, I want to liken that scenario to us with, with Christ. In the very beginning, when we walk with Jesus, we realize our absolute dependence on his sacrifice. This truth that impacts our life really changes us from the inside to the outside. And early on, we, we get it. We, we understand the great sacrifice that Christ made, and we want to live for him, for his glory. But as months go by, as years go by, we, we begin to get a little off the course. And, and rather making it all about the love of Jesus upon us, we begin to take some confidence in our abilities, in our strengths, our good works. And sooner or later, our focus shifts from the cross and back onto us. And we are no longer dependent on the grace of God, but we're independent of the grace of God. And soon we become dependent upon our good works, our good deeds. And sure, I mean, they're great things you're doing. I'm not here to dispute that. But the moment that it becomes about us, then we're in deep trouble, right? The moment it becomes about our good works and our good deeds, then we have totally misrepresented Jesus. We've totally misrepresented his sacrifice and the gospel, What I'm trying to say is this, is that your actions and my actions should be rooted in the perfect love, the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. So that not only are you seeing a manifestation of his love in your life, but that everybody around you will see the source of your love. So your coworkers, your students that are around you, your family members, everyone in your actions, in your uh, conduct, they will see the true source of your love, and that would be who else but Jesus Christ. That is what I'm hoping and, and, and asking for and imploring us to, is that we would understand that all of this is dependent upon his sacrifice. The very reason you and I are sitting here this morning, the reason we partake of that commu- of the communion Uh, bread and wine, is because of the absolute sacrifice that Jesus has made. And I love the way Sam prayed earlier this morning, is that everything that we are and everything that we will ever hope to be should always point back to the amazing truth and the amazing sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And just as his author is imploring the Jewish Christians to put away the old customs, to put away the old sacrifices, I'm encouraging you, my friends, to put away your old customs, to put away your old perspectives, and understand that each and every moment from the, mo- from the day you wake up, from the morning you wake up from your bed, and from the time you put your head back down to sleep at night, everything is, is, that you're experiencing is because of God's perfect sacrifice. And I pray that you and I would cultivate an awareness of Christ's love and perfect sacrifice all times from day to day so that we don't give the urge, given to the urge that we have to earn his love or become acceptable before him. He's already completed the work. He made purification for our sins. There is nothing left to be done. Jesus is the perfect priest. Turn back with me to, to verse 3 again, the last part of it. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels, as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. 
In these few words, we understand Jesus' role as king. Notice with me, it's after he accomplished this work of purification of sins that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. It's only after he's accomplished that work. Once he's done the mission, he, he takes his rightful place on the throne. And this is how it's described a little bit more in depth in Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. It says, Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus is positioned at the highest place of honor, the right hand of the Father. Jesus, in fact, is the greatest king. It's at his name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him as Lord. That would mean every ruler, every dictator, every president, every CEO, everybody who has ever walked and lived upon this planet will one day pronounce that he, Jesus, is the Lord of all. He is the greatest king. And typically when we think of a king, we think of someone who's seated on a throne with his hands folded And he's kind of looking across at his subjects and he's trying to figure out what things he can do to kind of benefit himself and make himself feel more comfortable to make sure his throne is not going to be attacked and that his reign will not be threatened. But the Bible tells us that Jesus' kingship is vastly different. In the book of Philippians, it says that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. So while other kings are busy worrying about their kingship, Jesus is concerned about you and about me. He's pleading, he's interceding, he's speaking on your behalf to the Father. This is what his kingship looks like. We are constantly in his heart, constantly being brought to his attention, and he constantly brings you to the Father, interceding on your behalf. So Jewish Christians or the Jewish people who receive this news from the author who, again, the author is conveying the kingship of Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus throughout the book of Hebrews. He is greater than any priest. He is greater than any prophet. He is greater than anyone that the Old Testament leaders out there. He's greater than all of them. Jesus is supreme. And so as Jewish people or the Jewish community is reading this information, they don't get this concept at all. How can Jesus be king? And perhaps this might have been the most troubling concept out of the three, out of being a prophet, priest, and king. This might be the most troubling concept because they knew how Jesus, what happened with Jesus' life, how he suffered, how he was mocked, ridiculed, and how he ultimately died on a cross. And to the Jewish people, to grasp the idea of a king who would suffer that demise, it was unheard of. What king do we know of that would die on a cross? And not for his own sin, but for the mistakes and the sins of his people. Any king comes to mind that would have taken the punishment of his people upon his own head to the point that he would die. There is no king that would do that aside from Jesus. And so we shouldn't be alarmed at the fact that Jewish, this Jewish community had to struggle to believe that because it didn't make sense. It really still doesn't make sense. Why would Jesus leave his position in heaven, come into this world, and bear the wrath the condemnation, the judgment of the world upon his own shoulders? That question is still a mystery. Sure, we know that he loves us, but that love is something that we have never encountered before and we will never encounter again. And the scriptures tell us that he does this thing 
but then he's, after he's done it, the second part is that he's now seated at the right hand of the Father. For many of us, we can readily receive the good news of Jesus dying for us on the cross, but we kind of want to bypass the second part where he is now seated on the throne and is a king over our lives. How many of you can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is your Savior, but have a difficult time acknowledging him as your king? How many of you can acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is your Savior, he's rescued you from sin, but you have a difficult time acknowledging him as king over your life? You you can't have one without the other, right? He's your Savior, but now he's on the right hand of the Father. He is king, Savior and king. You know, we always say, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. They go together. And so this morning, I want to urge you this morning to to really take a close look at your life. Take a very in-depth, personal inventory of your own life and begin to look at the parts of your life, every relationship, every personal ambition, every sin that might be present in your life and ask yourself, does Jesus reign as king over this area of my life? And I implore you to go deep. Don't leave any stone unturned. Go in depth into your life, every motive, everything you've done, everything you're thinking, everything that you've experienced in your life, every abuse, every shame, every hurt. Does Jesus reign as king over your life? We can readily accept the good news of his rescue, but we have a difficult time embracing him as our king. So I encourage you guys to to think through that for yourself. Uh, this morning, uh, as I conclude, I, I want to take a few moments just to think about what we talked about and as we're about to enter into communion. Um, we looked at Hebrews chapter 1, and we understand that he, Jesus, is being revealed to us as prophet, as priest, as king. And my hope is that you've understood him to be as your greatest prophet, your greatest priest, and your greatest king. Remember with me how I told you how Hebrews 1 verse 1 should have read. How I told you that it should have read that in these last days, God has spoken condemnation, judgment, and wrath upon the world, upon you, and upon me. That's how it should have read. But instead, we understand that it's read, it reads completely different. In these last days, God has spoken his son over us. But yet, The wrath of God didn't go away. The judgment of God did not go away. In place of that, we have Jesus, his Savior. And we we get this image of Christ kind of covering us, protecting us as God's wrath was coming down. God's judgment was coming down. It's him covering us and preventing us from engaging in that punishment that we rightfully deserve, from engaging in that death that we rightfully deserved. And so in a few moments when we partake of the bread and we partake of the juice, I want you to just to really uh, examine what it meant for Christ to embrace that responsibility, that that role, for him to, to leave his rightful place and to take on our punishment. And in every aspect, you know, how he was taken away from his community, how he was led away as a criminal, how he was tormented, how he was beaten. You know, I think it's so important for us to consider every aspect of his suffering, how he was whipped, how he was forced to wear a crown of thorns, how he was mocked by the Roman soldiers as being king of the Jews, but yet they took his wooden scepter and he beat him over the head with it repeatedly how they spat upon his face, how they ripped open his wounds. I think it's important for us to consider how he was forced to carry a wooden cross on his bleeding, broken back. I think it's important for us to consider how he was ultimately nailed on a cross where I should have been nailed or where you should have been nailed. And I think it's especially important for us to consider how he was stripped from the very presence of, of his father. 
And he cries out, Eli, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And there he is, taking the place of our judgment, taking the place of where we should have been in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. And I, I just hope that your reflection over his love, his, his blood, his life over you, um, would, would cause you to consider uh, just the immense love he has for you. And as a priest, the ultimate sacrifice that he paid, that you would consider the fact that it's his absolute love over you, his absolute sacrifice and grace that has, that has brought you here today to the place where you can say, I, I, have, I have a reason to live. I have a reason to, to believe and have hope. Perhaps you would consider the areas of your life that you really need to surrender to Christ as not just your Savior, but as your King this morning. So let's pray. Father, we just can't uh, put into words uh, our gratitude for your son, Jesus, and, and the fact that Hebrews chapter 1 should have read differently, should have read so much differently, God, that it would have resulted in our destruction, but that in our place, Jesus stepped in. And God, that story never gets old. And God, I pray for us as a community that we would embrace Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord and that embracing him would, would also shape us up, would, would change us as, as people in, our, in our, the way we live our lives, God, that our motivations, our ambitions, our actions would be completely changed because of the depth of his great love and the great sacrifice that he paid on our behalf. I pray that um, we would be forced to consider the fact that he is king over our lives and that every aspect of our lives, our personal uh, ambitions and relationships, all things, God, would be under his supreme authority. And God, that we would not strive to prove ourselves worthy to to you, that we would not strive to try to make ourselves perfect or presentable to you, but that we would understand each and every day that we are who we are because he simply loves us and offered up the sacrifice that brings us into a relationship with you. So God, we, we embrace that. We love you for that. And we acknowledge that as we're about to partake of the, the bread and the juice that it represents your perfect sacrifice. We love you, Jesus, that you are the greatest prophet, the greatest priest, and the greatest king. We love you, Jesus, and we ask this in your name. Amen.